is I try to, uh, I ask the Lord what he wants me to focus on, and I will highlight a truth from the morning message in the PM Bible study. And so this is a continuation in a way, but really it's turning the spotlight on what I'm calling New Testament giving. Now, this morning we talked about grace giving, which is really what New Testament giving is. But I wanted to say this. When I was a parent, and I, I still have kids, but I don't parent them anymore, unless they ask for my parenting advice, and they don't do that very often. But when I was a parent, one of my jobs was to teach our each one of our seven children how to ride a two-wheeler how to ride a bicycle. And uh, the way that I, I did that is they learned to begin to ride with training wheels. You know what training wheels are? Okay. We put training wheels on the back uh, uh, tire of the two-wheeler. And then when they got the feel of it and they developed a certain level of balance, maybe I just removed one of the training wheels. Or maybe I just removed both of them, depended on the child. And, uh, and I'd walk alongside of them and I'd hold just lightly on the back of the seat to help them to uh, maintain their balance. And eventually they'd be able to do it on their own. Eventually they'd get it and I, I'd let them go. I think of tithing as giving with training wheels. I think of tithing as giving on training wheels. Now, here's what I mean by that. Tithing, by the way, it was ingrained in the thinking of not only the Jewish people, but the ancient Near East. You read the ancient texts that even predates Judaism. And you'll find that giving that tithe or a tenth was part of pagan religions as well. So it's not just uh, it's not just peculiar to Judaism. What does a tithe mean? A tithe liter literally means a tenth part, a tenth part or ten percent. Now think of this: tithing if it's practiced at all in the New Testament church, tithing has its roots in Judaism. But here's a major difference that I want you to think about. Israel, the nation of Israel, when God gave the law and instituted tithing, as a part of the covenant that he made, the old covenant he made with Israel, Israel was at that time a theocracy. You know what a theocracy is? Democracy is ruled by the demos, the people. A theocracy is a rule by theos, God. Israel was a theocracy. And uh, tithing to an ancient Israelite, listen to me, it's not the same, but it's similar to what we call federal income tax because Israel was a theocracy. And uh, one of the tithes that Israelites were required to pay supported the religious workers, the priests and the Levites in the nation. A second tithe that Israelites were required to pay provided for the religious feasts that Israel celebrated, seven of them biblically. And then a third tithe was uh, required, and that would support, it was like their welfare system. It would support orphans and widows and the poor that were not able to work. Total annual tithing amount in Israel averaged about 23% per Israelite. Not 10%, but tithing in three different areas, it averaged about 23%. In addition to that, 
and that's their total income. That's their gross income, 23%. But additionally, there were offerings. Some of the offerings were required. For instance, there was a required first fruits offering three times a year. They were to give the, the first fruits of that particular harvest to the Lord. In addition to that, there were voluntary offerings that they didn't have to give, but they could voluntarily give. So when you add all of it up, the average Israelite would give anywhere between 23 to 30 percent of their total income to the Lord annually. What is the purpose then that God intended when he instituted tithing in that old covenant with the ancient nation of Israel? Well, I think it was a way in which God was demanding them to give regularly, a way in which God would teach them to give regularly and systematically. It was a way in which God helped them to remember and to recognize that God owned everything and they were infinitely indebted to him. It was a way that God would teach the Israelites to put him first, to give him the first fruits of uh, their increase. That being said, now I want to talk about New Testament giving, what we call this morning grace giving after we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the way in which you lead and the way in which your truth develops and unfolds progressively in the scripture, like uh, fr from a, uh, a, a budding flower to full bloom. We pray that you'll teach us today as we look at these scriptures and show us the truth that you want us to continue to understand regarding New Testament giving or grace giving. We thank you for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. Lord, teach us to give like him. Teach us to give like you give. You know, give us that kind of sacrificial, uh, loving giving that would glorify you. And that, as we said this morning, then secondarily, and really as a fringe benefit, would enrich us and others that are blessed by our giving in Jesus' name. Amen. So, every New Testament believer is to give. And we have some examples of that. I believe that New Testament give, giving is to be beyond tithing. When you look at tithing, it's really considered the minimum standard. In fact, the early church, which can I remind you, was basically all Jewish. Tithing was part of the, the system that they grew up in. And so the early church, the early church community, um, they did not uh, stand against tithing, obviously, but they considered tithing to be the minimum standard for Christian giving. In fact, there are men that are considered the fathers of the early church. One of them was a man named Irenaeus. Irenaeus was a student of Polycarp, and Polycarp was tutored by the Apostle John, okay? So you're only like one generation removed from direct uh, connection with Jesus as a disciple. Well, here's what Irenaeus, this early church father, said. He said, and I'm quoting, Jews were constrained to a regular payment of tithing. Christians who have liberty assign all of their possessions to the Lord, bestowing freely not the lesser portion of their property, since they have the hope of greater things. So let me repeat what I began with in my introduction, and that is simply this. I believe that if people as New Testament believers tithe, they are giving with training wheels on. It's giving with training wheels. It's like, you know, 
when a child learns to walk. They they can't walk. <laughs> they stumble. They fall. And they have they take a few steps and they tumble and they have to be helped up and and finally they learn to walk. That's what tithing is. It's like not really. It's just learning to walk. And when you learn to walk, you walk. I'm talking about walking with the Lord. You learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. You learn to discern His voice and know His urgings and promptings in your heart. And uh, as a result, you give based upon the Holy Spirit's leading in your life and based upon his enablement in which he supplies. So grace given is not so much tithing, but there are three ways that I'm going to describe it. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I know we were here last week. Uh, last Sunday morning in 2 Corinthians, I'm going to just point out several verses as we look at grace giving once again. And the first one is in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 8, where Paul is just really excited about what the churches of Macedonia have done as far as giving to this special offering that he is taking up for the needy believers in Jerusalem. Remember those churches, some of them, if I could name them, one was uh, Thessalonica, another one was uh, Philippi, a third one would be Berea. These are all churches in Macedonia, and he's just marveling about their, their, uh, their generosity in giving. Last week we talked about the generosity of giving. Today we're, we are talking about how you can't outgive God. And in verse 5, here's what they did when they gave, before they gave. And this they did, not as we hope, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So in verse 5, here is the spirit of New Testament giving. Here is the spirit of New Testament giving. Before a believer gives a penny to the Lord, there is something that the believer ought to give first before they give any money to the Lord. They ought to do what verse 5 says. They ought to give themselves to the Lord. When it says that these believers first gave themselves to the Lord, what it means is that they totally surrendered themselves to God. They said, God, I want you to have all of me and all that I have because I've been bought with a price. I'm not my own. And so everything that I am belongs to you. You've redeemed me by your poured out life and blood. And because everything that I am belongs to you, everything that I have belongs to you because everything that I have has come from you anyway. You remember how David marveled that God would take an offering from him that God himself has first given to David? This is the thing. Here's the spirit of giving. It is, first of all, a giving of self to the Lord, a total surrender of the believer to the Lord, a self-emptying where you give yourself to God all that you are and all that you possess. Have you ever done that? Have you ever reached that level of giving in your personal life with the Lord? That number one, you've totally surrendered to the Lord. And in that, you recognize that you totally surrender all that you have to him as well. This is what it means in verse 8, that they gave first their own selves to the Lord. They gave self. You may not remember, I was alive. I remember when Lyndon Baines Johnson was the president of the United States of America. He was a big, proud Texan. He was a rancher. I read that on the wall of uh, Johnson's uh, White House office, there hung a framed letter written by General Sam Houston. Ever hear of Houston, Texas? It's named after Sam Houston. He was... Uh, he was a leading general. I think he was in the Alamo, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, General Sam Houston wrote a letter to John Baines, who was Lyndon Johnson's great-grandfather. 
And uh, the letter, when it hung on his wall, was over 100 years old then. And uh, it was John Baines, Johnson's great-grandfather, had the privilege of leading Sam Houston to the Lord. And when Sam Houston got saved, they said that General Houston's life totally changed. He was a changed man. He was no longer crude and brutal like he had been, no longer belligerent like he had been in the past. He had that reputation. Now he became a very peaceful and a contented type of man. Well, after General Houston was baptized, he offered to pay the half of the pastor's salary. And when he was asked why, he said, because my pocketbook got baptized too. You get the point? When you surrender yourself to the Lord, you surrender your pocketbook too. When you give yourself, you give everything you possess to him. It's his decision now. It's what he wants and not what I want. So the spirit of New Testament giving is first of all, you give yourself. And when you give yourself, you know what? Your giving becomes selfless. You become a selfless giver. That's what verses two to four really indicate. How that in a great trial of affliction, these Macedonian churches, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality, their generosity. For to their power, I bear record, yea, beyond their own power, they were willing of themselves, that is to give, praying us, begging us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take it up, take upon us this fellowship of ministering to the needs of the saints. You see the selflessness in these people? They first gave themselves to the Lord, and when you give yourself to the Lord, you're emptying yourself of self, and so you become selfless in your giving. And what they are doing is pictured here of putting the brethren, putting others and the needs of their brothers over their own needs before themselves. It's the sacrifice of a heart that is selfless because of the bonds of brotherly love that uh, they have a deep appreciation for who God is and what he's done for them. And they're willing to give even above their own need to others. When you are totally surrendered to the Lord, when you have emptied yourself when you become selfless in your giving, there's no room for selfishness. There's no room for greed. It's not uh, uh, that we want to hoard for ourselves anymore, but we want to be a blessing to our brethren. We want to be a blessing to others. By the way, that just reminds me of Acts chapter 4. You remember uh, Barnabas was one example, but there were other believers in that early church in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem church was suffering. That's why this special offering is being taken here in chapter 8 and 9. The, the, the Jerusalem believers were suffering. They had been persecuted. Many of them had lost their jobs because of Jesus. And, uh, and, and then there was a famine that wiped out the crops. So they, they were starving and they needed help. And that's what this is about. But uh, the point that I wanted to make was that uh, the people that were helping them were people that cared more about these needy believers than they cared about themselves. And they had needs themselves, but they believed that God would meet their needs if they would put others before themselves. So they're being very selfless, not wanting to hoard money or things for themselves, but rather be a blessing to their brothers. So... The spirit of giving, of New Testament giving, first of all, you give yourself. And when you give yourself, then you're selfless in your giving. But the thing also that I mentioned this morning, I want to uh, labor a, a little bit again, is when he says in that first verse of chapter 8, 2 Corinthians, brethren, we want you to know to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. 
What's, what's he saying? You know what he's saying? He's saying, we want you to know these people that gave so generously did so because of the grace of God that was active in their lives. You know what that tells me? The spirit of New Testament giving is not only, first of all, giving yourself and thus being selfless, being self-empty, but it is supernatural. New Testament giving is supernatural. It's not just human. It's not just a human person writing a check, you know, and saying, boom, I've done it. No, it's a supernatural act. Grace, seven times in this chapter. Remember what grace means? Grace is all of God's ability and all of my inability. Well, let me tell you, God's ability is supernatural ability. It's not just natural. It's supernatural. It is miraculous. And so what we're talking about here is that the giving of these people is the result of the supernatural enablement of the Spirit of God in them. They're giving because the Holy Spirit gives them the ability to be truly selfless and to be a sacrificial giver. Well, let's go back for a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Actually, that would probably be the where we stay the rest of the, our, our time, and I'll be done in just a few minutes, and we'll have some Q&A. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is actually the whole basis for what he's talking about in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. It's a special collection. It's a special offering that he's taking up for these needy believers in the Jerusalem church, which is the mother church of all of these Gentile churches that uh, Paul is the church planter involved, but he's been sent out uh, indirectly from the mother church, which is the church at Jerusalem, which uh, sent him to the church in Antioch, and then the church in Antioch sent him and, and, uh, and Barnabas and then him and Silas to all these other places in what was then uh, Asia Minor, today is modern Turkey, and he even got, uh, you know, as far as Rome and, uh, and Spain. So the fact of the matter is, the, 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 the point is simply this, that uh, this mother church was now in financial distress. And so Paul is speaking to that in the last chapter of the first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians. Look at it with me in verse 1 of chapter 16. Because here he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, he means the Jerusalem church. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, that's a, a, that's a section in what is today modern Turkey, but Asia Minor then, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now, giving, New Testament giving, I said already, is, is grace giving, and I talked about the spirit of it. But now I want to talk about it as a process, because that's what he brings out here in these first four verses, that giving as a New Testament believer, involves a process. It is Holy Spirit-led giving that happens through a, a Bible-guided heart that is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That, understand that? That makes sense? What I'm saying is the process of New Testament giving involves you as an individual believer walking with the Lord, reading his word, and, and the Bible guides you as the Spirit of God in you indwells you and speaks to you and leads you through your time in his word. So it's a process. But look at verse 1, because here we get direction. Where do you give? Where do you give? Well, he, he says, I have, concerning the collection, I've given order to the churches. So 
the basic place that God has put into place for New Testament Christian giving is not first and foremost parachurch ministries. You know what that means? Parachurch ministries. It's uh, Christian ministries that are not uh, necessarily part of a local church. Okay. What, what he's saying here is it's permissible to give to Christian ministries that are not a local church, but predominantly New Testament Christian giving ought to be in and through the local church. Okay. I have given order to the churches, he says. And so the place or where Christian New Testament giving is to be predominantly taking place is in and through local churches, like the ones then in Galatia, like the ones in Macedonia, like Corinth. Okay. Second, he tells us when we should give. Look at verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, which we know, of course, is Sunday, there should be a regular each Sunday at your local church. By the way, that's not the only time that you can give, obviously, but it ought to be the predominant time when we give to God's work. By the way, you know, there are many believers that don't give to the Lord's work at all. And I think most believers, if they give, they give very sporadically. And if they miss, maybe because they're sick on a Sunday or they're on vacation, they seldom make up the missed opportunities that they, they've had that they've missed to give. But where? The local church. When? The first day of the week. And then who's to give? Look at verse 2 again. Every one of you, every one of you, every believer, without any exception, you say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not employed right now. Every one of you are to give. Now, obviously, we don't all give the same amount, but we're all to give. You know, I've read some statistics that uh, four out of ten people that attend local churches don't give at all. And then another statistic is that two or three out of ten people that, it, that attend local churches, if they do give, they give almost nothing. You know what giving is? Giving is a reminder that our lives are not about us, but about God. That's part of it. Who is to give? Every one of you, all believers. What are we to give? Look again at verse 2. He says, <clears throat> let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. What are we to give? Well, normal giving is we are to give as God has prospered. We are to give proportionately. As God has prospered us. Because, folks, listen, Holy Spirit giving is to be led by the Holy Spirit in your giving means that it's not a fixed amount that you give every time you give. It could be different. It could be the same. But it's not necessarily a fixed amount. If we're listening to the Holy Spirit, we will give as he leads us to give, and normally it's proportionately, as he says here, but it's also deliberately. It's a determined amount that the Holy Spirit lays upon our heart, leads us to give, and we set it aside. See that in verse 2? It's set aside during the week for Sunday, for the first day of the week. You, lay it, you set it aside each week, so when it comes to Sunday, you're ready to give it systematically regularly, okay? Hey, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You have a problem with that? Then, you know, take it up with the with the Lord. This is what the Bible says. It's in the Bible. I think I have to preach it, don't you? Whether you like it or not. 
whether I like it or not. Let me tell you, let me share something with you, three things that I think will help you here. Three things that uh, this, a businessman who first, he, ban he, he began giving 10%. He began with the training wheels of tithing. And then he kept increasing it until he ended up giving half of all of his income to the Lord. And here's what he said. This is how he came to it. He said, every believer needs to meet with God to determine God's goals for their giving. Okay? You have to meet with God to determine God's goals for your giving. And by that, he means ask God to put a certain specific burden on your heart to focus your giving on. And then he said, secondly, each week, ask the Holy Spirit to lay a particular amount on your heart and then to give you the ability to give it in a joyful attitude of obedience. Thirdly, he said, ask yourselves what prevents you from giving to the Lord generously. And then ask God to deal with you in that area that is preventing your generosity and your giving to the Lord. This is what this Christian businessman said he did. And God enabled him then to give 50% of his income to the work of the Lord. How are we to give? Look at verse 3. Paul says, when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring, notice this, what he calls it their offering, your liberality, to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. What's he talking about? He's saying you're to give sacrificially. You're to give generously. You're to ask God to show you. Here, here, here's a thought. Ask God to show you the income level that he wants you to live on and then give all above that to God, to the work of the Lord. You give voluntarily. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 that we, uh, we saw this morning? It's a wonderful verse and great principle. Every man gives as he purposeth in his heart. Let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. How are you to give? You're to give voluntarily. You're to give free will offerings. You're to give above and beyond your, your regular giving as God uh, enables you and leads you to. You're to give cheerfully. Your giving ought to be a delight to the Lord. God loves cheerful givers. Our giving ought to be delightful to the Lord. 